So the, the big question is, uh, how do we uh, feed people in the world and conserve ocean resources at the same time? You know, as we uh, celebrate the seven billionth person arriving on the world uh, here this year, um, and we're looking at um, that growth rate of people increasing over the next 20 years, how do we feed those people? And at the same time, how do we make sure that we uh, conserve uh, stocks and species in the oceans? And uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, but the way the uh, U.S. has approached this um, is that the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, has taken the lead on most fish stocks around the nation and used a really data-intensive um, process of developing stock assessments. And stock assessments are mathematical models that predict the uh, f uh, trend, uh, future and past trends, of population sizes of different species. And they incorporate lots of information from uh, people going to sea to talk about the discards and uh, catch per effort, um, information about the biology of the animals in the lab, uh, what are called landing tickets or the catches of commercial and recreational uh, fleets. Some uh, people in the lab are uh, reading otoliths and estimating the ages and percentages of uh, different ages of uh, fishes and fishery independent surveys. And all of this goes into a stock assessment model that gets crunched and crunched and crunched. It comes out and uh, goes to the Pacific Fishery Management Council where um, allowable catch estimates are provided and promulgated in, in to, as regulations. And the, that process um, has some challenges. Uh, first of all, it's really expensive and there's a huge amount of information is needed to reduce the uncertainty of the, those estimates. Basically, we're trying with those stock assessments to catch as many fish as we can without uh, over harvesting those fish. To get to that level, it takes a lot of information. It's complex, um, it's cumbersome, it takes a long time. Any of you who have been to a council meeting know how um, excruciatingly slow the councils move. It's a political process. But more importantly, when stocks are low, there's less fishery dependent information and, and that's informa that's uh, information that's coming from the commercial or recreational fisheries. Um, when that happens, uh, when stocks are low, regulations become more conservative, so there's a loss of yield or food to people, and there's a loss of revenue. When revenue goes down, there are fewer fishery independent surveys, there's less money for research, and that just keeps on spiraling down. And so the result of that is greater uncertainty, and you're more likely to underutilize the species in some areas. There are fewer species that are assessed and it results in a situation that is called data poor, data limited fisheries. And that's uh, typical around the world. Another challenge is that um, we have more species in the ocean that can be feasibly be assessed. Um, and so we're inadvertently over harvesting some species uh, to catch others. So in the uh, United States, it's been estimated that only about 50% of the over 528 stocks of fish um, that are managed uh, have a, um, a known estimate or a stock size. And that complicates things moreover as we start to figure out how to move from a single species management approach to an ecosystem-based management approach. Um, you have this great disparity in the amount of information for different kinds of species. Another challenge with our current system is that uh, for um, the sake of uh, money and ease, w our west coast is broken into you know, five different uh, management areas. And the regulations uh, for the Monterey, Bay, um, the Monterey management uh, region are the same throughout the entire region. But we know from Dr. Hamilton's work that uh, we have um, substocks or metapopulations that the growth curves, the uh, life histories are very different, even in small areas. Scott's shown that here just in the Southern California area, 
uh, you have great differences in growth of the sheephead and age and, and size at maturation. And that plays havoc with these statistical models that rely upon one number for a fishing mortality rate or a birth rate. So um, g given the ex extensive comprehensive system we had, we've still made some errors as fishery scientists. And in 1976, the Fishery Conservation Management Act was passed, and that started the start of the modern fishery management. Modern fisheries principles started back in the 40s and 50s, the, some of the foundational ideas, but the start of the f this large-scale um, money-intensive system was in the 76 area. And look what happened after we started that. We um, had a lot of species crash for a variety of reasons I won't go into. Um, and then the, that act was uh, reauthorized in 1996, uh, I was renamed the Sustainable Fisheries Act. And that uh, required the uh, federal government to make uh, much more conservative uh, rules relative to harvesting. In 2002, we have uh, as, a, as a result of this and a result of these um, stocks that were overfished, we had uh, a large area f uh, off the coast from about 100 meters deep to 200 meters deep closed along the whole west coast, and that's called the rockfish conservation area. Along those same lines, the uh, state of California uh, passed a law, the Marine Life Management Act, uh, that um, was a conservation-oriented act as well, and it did a couple things, uh, one of which was to wrest uh, management out of the legislature and put it in the F Fish and Game Commission where it belongs, uh, but also uh, required um, fishery management plans that would be developed and based upon information. So that act was passed there along with the uh, Marine Life Protection Act, which, with, uh, which mandated MPAs, and the MPAs went into effect here in Central California in 2007. But you can see that there's this, uh, primarily because of the uh, regulations and the RCA, we've seen an uh, upward trend in some of the species. So this is the area that we're in for the Central California part of the Marine Life Protection Act. But now we have reserves um, strewn up and down the coast, the whole length of the, of the coast. So those MPAs, which were, are going to help conservation, are also going to be a challenge for fisheries management. Because again, those stock assessments I talked with all assume that all areas are fished equally and that fish are distributed equally throughout all of the areas. But uh, these MPAs uh, and the rockfish conservation area as well, which is a, a, in essence an MPA, makes those stock assessments, those assumptions for those stock assessments uh, invalid to some extent. Um, and then the other question is, you know, the MPAs are presumably closed for a long time, but the RCAs, are, are they going to be closed until the uh, last of the overfish species recovers? So those um, all affect the management regulations and the stock assessments. So the, the rel results of this great conservation work that we've done um, is that we've got severe fishery restrictions now. We got some uncertainty in fishing opportunities. We don't know when the RCA will be reopened. Uh, we've had some negative impacts on harbors and communities. Uh, we've seen a lot of vessels and people leave the fishery, um, which is a good thing uh, for the few people who are remaining. Their income has gone up. But uh, overall, um, there are fewer boats uh, to um, require the uh, secondary businesses, such as boat repair facilities, um, that will spin up dollars to the community. Because the rockfish conservation is area is closed in deep water, that's pushed a lot of fishing pressure into shallow water, making the um, stocks in shallow water a lot uh, more heavily fished. And some of those stocks haven't been assessed. So that makes, um, that's a conservation trade-off there. And then if this continues, we'll see increased political involvement and you know, we'll see where that goes. Um, so the, 
conservation actions that have occurred in the last 15 years have been really beneficial to the um, populations of fish. We had that uh, regime shift in 99, which also helped, but um, we've had taken really strong uh, conservation measures on the west coast of California to protect species. Okay, that's great, but now how do we get as much yield from those stocks as we can uh, without affecting those great conservation measures we've taken? And this is a problem that's occurring around the world, and a lot of people in Australia and New Zealand and South Africa have been thinking about this, and um, we worked with uh, DFG folks, Deb was involved in that, uh, Paul was there to talk to people from around the world in 2008 about you know, how do we get out of a data poor fishery uh, situation. And since that time, there have been a number of different interesting models that have been developed. Um, and about in that time as well, uh, Dean went from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and I uh, formed the California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program, and our goals were to uh, bring together um, the fishing fleets, the skippers, recreational anglers, uh, agency scientists, academic scientists, um, together in the same room to talk about how we could uh, monitor MPAs and gather information to improve fishery management, specifically in this near shore zone that hasn't had a lot of attention uh, about uh, from the stock assessment scientists. So the benefits of the collaborative research are, have well been documented um, from various different studies. It increases sampling frequency. You can reduce costs, overall management costs, if you endorse this technique. You use effective sampling gear. Uh, you get people uh, and you use the expertise of uh, the fishermen. You get people who know how to uh, use gear uh, sampling rather than you know, dorky scientists going out <laughs> and trying to figure out how they fish. Um, <laughs> uh, we won't name any names, will we? <laughs> um, it also allows you to catch, to gather more fine scale information about the meta populations or subpopulations that are occurring along the coast. And it allows you to uh, talk with the people who are using the resource and uh, share ideas and establish common goals and understandings of the, of the status of the resource. More importantly, from the MPA perspective, there's just a strong sentiment uh, worldwide, the consensus that if you're gonna have successful marine reserves, you gotta have the people who are affected involved in, in that, involved in the monitoring or involved in some way. Otherwise, they'll just, they'll just go on and keep on fishing in those reserves. They got to have some ownership of that. So that's, was one of, that's one of the goals we have with the CCFRP is to kind of um, in, increase the level of kind of the uh, ownership and stewardship of the nearshore resources. The MLPA is interesting and in that it requires evaluation of MPAs. Um, the Marine Life Management Act also says that the state should use uh, should integrate uh, the marine protected areas into their fishery management plans. And I know the Department of Fish and Wildlife has been thinking about it for, um, since that act was written and designed and has been uh, taking measures uh, in the last few years to try to work on ways to integrate this. Um, we think we've got a, a way to do that. So um, briefly, what we've been doing is um, surveying areas within this 225 mile stretch of coastline in Central California using standardized fishing techniques. We have people who work for a couple years up at uh, Humboldt State in, Ure in the um, Port of Eureka, or Port of, Port of Eureka or Port of Humboldt Bay? Port of Eureka, um, who have been using these same techniques and they documented uh, differences in density of fishes as you go further away from port. Um, and then we have people on uh, Southern Oregon who are using th th these techniques as well, and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is gearing up to use these for MPAs. You know, our hope is that we can get uh, this kind of work along the whole coastline to provide more information uh, for uh, fishery managers and for the uh, MPA managers. 
So we're monitoring to um, assess um, the so-called reserve effects, where we'd expect to see increased abundance and density of fishes, increased species diversity, increased size and age of fishes, increased biomass, and reproductive output. And because we are monitoring um, after the start of the establishment of the NPAs, we're not using a back year before after control experiment, we're uh, looking at the trends. And you, simply, you can think of um, these as possible ways to see a positive MPA effect. If the MPA goes up and the reference area stays stable or the MPA is stable, reference areas go down, these all end up in a net gain in uh, relative abundance inside the M MPAs. And we work with uh, the nearshore uh, charter boat fishery and the nearshore uh, commercial trap fishery, work with folks who've uh, been involved in the live fish fishery. Where our sampling design is a fishery independent uh, sampling design. It's a uh, stratified random sampling design where we have, let's just say this point Lobos MPA, and I'll be talking about this in a few minutes, but notice this area, which is the old point Lobos uh, marine ecological reserve, which has been in place since 1973. But we have these MPAs, and then we use the seafloor bottom maps that have been produced for the coast uh, to stratify the habitats into these nearshore rocky areas and randomly sample uh, cells inside the MPA and then outside in, in reference sites. And then this is where the fisherman's expertise comes in we work with the skippers to say, we want you to fish in this box and fish in at least three different areas, but uh, fish as you would if, as if you were on your um, out fishing recreationally for the day. And we fish in, uh, we work in uh, f five different MPAs along the coast, and then we worked with a fellow named Scott Lucas with the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, to work, uh, who used our techniques to work in the Carmel Pinnacles. So we have information for this whole stretch of, of coastline that is uh, identically collected. And I won't go into that. You've probably seen um, or heard stories of what we do. But ba the key is that we use uh, standardized gear for st and fish for standardized amounts of time and record all that so we get a very good estimate of catch uh, per angler hour. The other thing we do is we spend a lot of time talking with the uh, volunteer anglers at sea, talking to them about the life history of fishes, talking to them about management issues, talking to them about um, conservation issues. And we also do the same thing uh, working with the nearshore trap fishermen where we have standardized uh, protocols for fishing with traps. And we measure the fish and tag them, sex them if we can, and release them. and um, reduce the barotrauma by recompressing them um, if necessary. So very quickly here, this is uh, uh, Cheryl and Andrea uh, handling a lingcod and tagging it and um, putting it overboard. One of the key things with our work is that we try to uh, capture the fish and get it back in the water as quickly as possible. Uh, some Work with barotrauma st studies have shown if you can get the fish back in the water within about five minutes of catching it, you've minimized the trauma associated uh, with bringing it up at, from depth. So we, here are the results of our six years of um, sampling this way. We've caught almost 45,000 fishes out of uh, 46 different species, and we've had 665 different people volunteer with us who have spent more than 900 uh, angler days uh, fishing. We work with 17 different commercial fishing vessels, 19 different uh, skippers, and in five harbors in, in Central California. So it's been a, a huge amount of uh, time at sea and a really um, valuable data set. So with the analyses, what we're trying to do is to uh, characterize the state of the ecosystem. Uh, those are the uh, terms that are uh, being used for understanding MPAs these days. Basically, we're trying to look at species and size composition, relative abundances, habitat associations, 
and asking some questions about how the MPAs are working now. Well, with the uh, commercial trap fishing, we caught about, uh, I think, 15 different species of fishes, some of which, which we didn't catch in the uh, hook and line. And we also caught, interestingly enough, 19 different taxa of invertebrates, um, mostly sea stars and crabs. And we, we catch about 500 um, per area per year. So um, kind of without knowing it, I think we have an interesting assessment of invertebrates in the MPAs a, as well. Uh, when you look at the species composition, I said we caught 46 different species, but only about 11, I don't know, somebody can count, see if that's 11 or, or more, but only about 11 uh, species uh, occupy, I mean, account for about 90% of, of the fish caught, and the other 30-some uh, are relatively uncommon. Um, it's interesting here, we look at Anio Nuevo, and you can see a large percentage of the uh, fishes up there are, are blacks. And you the other place you see a lot of black rock fishes at Point Bouchon. And those areas are both uh, sedimentary rock, uh, sandstone type rocks that mm -hmm. form the reefs um, in, the, in this area. And then Point Lobos and Piedras Blancas are primarily made up of blues, and olive rock fishes, um, and that's because those are more those are granitic, uh, granitic uh, habitats. And the other thing you'll notice here is that the gopher rockfish is uh, one of the main components of the nearshore area. So one of the things that we've done recently is to um, do some cluster analysis to see if these MPAs are similar to one another. And when we uh, develop this dendrogram or similarity, uh, we see that uh, the Point Lobos and Point Bouchon areas uh, are similar in terms of species composition. Año Nuevo is different, Piedras Blancas is different, and interestingly, that old Point Lobos area, that orange area, uh, shows up as a different community composition as well. And when you look at uh, this chart right here, which is I don't have an axis here, but this is density, uh, of, or catch, um, catch per angler hour, that density. You can see why there are similarities and differences. First of all, the old Point Lobos area stands out because it's got a whole bunch of fish, and many of them are blue rockfish. Whereas, as I said, the black rockfish show up at uh, Año Nuevo and uh, Point Bouchon areas. We wanted to see if we were uh, sampling similar areas when we looked inside the reserve and outside the reserve or reference sites. I, I showed you those trends early on through time about how, how is the MPA doing to a reference site. Well, it's important that the, your reference site has the same kinds of species going on uh, in that area. Uh, otherwise, you're comparing apples to oranges. We want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. And uh, using this break critter similarity analysis, you see that the AN, which is the Año Nuevo areas, uh, all clustered. The Point Bouchon areas all clustered. Point Lobos areas and the Piedras Blancas areas clustered, saying that those areas are all more similar to themselves, the reference and, and MPA sites, than to each other, telling us that we've done a good job of selecting reference sites. Okay, so now let's take a look at. Uh, five years of uh, catch per angler hour data, all species combined for those four MPAs. A um, couple things to note here. Uh, first of all, the, this is a uh, kind of a, a background level of catch per angler hour is somewhere between you know five and ten fish per angler hour. Um, that the Point Lobos area uh, started out um, is is has much higher densities of fish than other locations. Um, but also the Piedras Blancas and Point Bouchon MPAs started out with more fish than the reference sites. And during this process, uh, fishermen were saying, you guys selected all the good areas, be, um, and of course you're going to see more fish in the MPAs and the reference sites because they started out that way. Well, they were, in, you know, they were indeed right that these areas, um, for some reason, are better have had higher densities of fish starting out, and, and still do. 
Only up at Año Nuevo are the reference sites and the MPAs uh, very similar. Another thing I'll show you here is that I noticed there's a big decline uh, in these, this for the uh, first three years. Um, and I'll get back to that. But the next thing we do is, in, in addition to getting catch per angular hour information, we have length frequency information. And this is important um, because the uh, other folks who get information about lengths are the scuba divers swimming through the kelp forest. And there are uh, ontogenetic movements. So fishes, as they grow older, will move out of the kelp forest. So it's important to have an understanding of what's going on outside uh, the kelp forest because we're not, we haven't been surveying those areas. And w what we do with that information is develop these uh, whisker plots where uh, this is the total length on this axis, an MPA and reference for uh, this particular MPA. And these are e individual years. So let's just take this at Point Lobos. Blue is 2007, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And the black bar here is the median length of all the fish we caught. And uh, the colored area represents uh, the uh, 75th percentile. So 75% of the fish are in between those lengths. And that allows us to evaluate uh, kind of how well the um, population si size structure is occurring. And then this dotted line is the length at which 50% of that species is mature. So if you have fish, majority of fish above that, that means we're sampling mostly mature fish. And if you have the majority of fish below, we're sampling mostly immature fish. So this is important because uh, one of the uh, theories of MPAs is that you want to protect the big old fecund females, the boffs. And we see that for uh, this is the proportion of individuals now that we've surveyed that are over 50% mature. And you'll see that in, uh, for the most part, the MPAs have a higher percentage of mature fish than others, than outside the, in the reference areas. And that's where selecting those sites, is, you know, come, turns out to be a, a good thing. Because maybe that's better habitat and we're protecting a uh, higher percentage of the uh, larger, more fecund females. Conversely, if you see a situation like this, you have to shake your head because these are black rockfish caught in our survey and we've only seen a couple that are, that are above the length of 50% maturity. So it makes you wonder how these populations are maintaining uh, given the fact that they're all small. And a couple years ago, uh, Kristen Green uh, did some work with black rockfish off of Bolinas and she looked at the ovaries and, and certainly all the fish we caught were immature. Okay, so I'm going to breeze through this quickly in the interest of time, but we were under some pressure to um, say what happened in the first five years of the MPAs uh, for this MPA symposium we had last week. And I didn't expect to see any changes at all because the species that we're looking at are for the most part really old and you would expect it to take 10 to 15 or 20 years to see, have changes accumulate based upon that uh, reserve protection. But what we did was that we took the ratio of the density inside the reserve to the outside the reserve um, in 2011 or actually this is 2010 and 11, um, and divided that by the, the logarithm of the ratio of the density inside to the outside early in 2007, 2008. So that would uh, tell you what has changed over time. And uh, when you do that, you see that all of these species here have increased over time inside the reserve relative to outside side in the reference area. Now, when, when somebody first sees that, he says, woohoo, the reserves are working. But um, remember that there are at least two ways to see a positive reserve effect. The reserve can go up where the um, reference area stays neutral or goes down, or they can go, both go down and the reserve is, goes down more slowly than the, the reference sites. 
So each, either one of those could have resulted in this positive um, result over here. The other thing is that the summary plots, this is a summary of all MPAs combined, they mask individual differences. The good news though um, is that when you look at this old point Lobos reserve that's been there for 40 years, we see this enormous um, ratio of from the old reserve to the, um, what we call the new reserve, which wasn't a reserve until just a couple years ago, you know, from anywhere, you know, from two to 16 or 20 times as many uh, fish in the old Point Lobos Reserve as nearby. And that, to me, is w way past the uh, difference in habitat amount. So I think it's evidence that uh, if we let these reserves sit around for a long enough time, we will see these changes. Also, when we look at the lengths of fishes, we had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six species that were significantly larger inside the old reserve than the new reserve. Now, this is important because people have been trying for about 10 or 15 years to see if this has occurred, but we've been using mostly um, scuba surveys occurring in the kelp forest, and we haven't seen as big a result as we have out here in the deeper water uh, where people have been fishing. So that's where the, that's where you expect to see the, um, the differences. Uh, we're also looking at the, um, statistically looking at uh, what uh, species have increased in size and length using a repeated measures mixed regression model. And this looks like just a um, bunch of spaghetti to me. But when, <laughs> when you do this, the math, it turns out that um, we've seen an increase in either density or mean length in, of these species in these different uh, MPAs. And then there's been a negative um, regression uh, for a few species in those MPAs. So why, should we, why are we seeing significant differences so soon? It's, I think we're seeing it be because it's the habitat. And there's been a number of, there have been a number of different uh, people around the world who've speculated that the prime habitat both buffers, um, provides more resiliency by buffering for um, disasters from overfishing and also allows those, prime, those primary habitats are more likely to rebound faster than outside areas because they're more productive. But also, you can't, you can't forget the effects of those, that conservative fisheries management action. I think that's had a much larger effect on seeing a number of these species uh, recover th than the MPAs. Let's drill down a little bit into the detail. Um, interesting, uh, here at Point uh, Bouchon, um, a, a large increase in lynx, lingcod inside the reserve. Um, you see uh, Lincoln and Yer Nuevo increasing in the reserve, but it, at uh, Point Lobos and Piedras Blancas, uh, not much difference. Blue rockfish is the, the big um, question or interesting question because we see a crash inside the reserve at Point Bouchon and also at Point Lobos. Um, and this, is the, this pattern occurred both in our data and the scuba data uh, from both ReefCheck and the Pisco surveys. My belief is that, uh, remember, there were 2004, 5, and 6 were really horrible oceanographic years. We had seabirds dying off. We had no salmon coming back. You know, I, I believe that uh, that uh, affected the blue rockfish populations as well because um, Something happened right there, and then we saw this decline for those three years. There's some evidence that they're starting to improve a little bit now, but um, that was a major shift. But the good news about the, this is one of my strong take home points. One of the real benefits of marine protected areas is to determine whether or not we're seeing changes that are anthropogenic caused by fishing or whether they're natural caused by the environment. This shows you that that crash in blue rockfish didn't have anything to do with fishing. It was all environmentally driven. 
Also, good news is that up at uh, Año Nuevo, uh, we saw this enormous increase in uh, small black rockfish, uh, as you can see referenced by the uh, decline in size. Um, much greater in the uh, reference site than in the MPA, but it's also occurring in the MPA as well. Um, so there's a great recruitment year of black rockfish. So where did those little buggers come from if there aren't any adults running around? We're going to figure that out. <laughs> and we're also doing power analysis here uh, so we can understand just how well um, we can predict these changes. And the bottom line is that um, you have to have enough numbers of a fish to predict. It's really difficult to do any good definitive stats on this if you're only catching a handful uh, at a time. We've tagged fish and uh, seen some movements uh, as far away as uh, Oregon and Washington, uh, but for the most part, the, most species aren't moving very much. And one of the things that Dan Malone, who's working with us, is doing right now is we're doing some factor analysis. Um, so trying to see if we can estimate what's going on with those uncommon species by looking at relationships with the common species where we can get good stats on them. So we're doing this uh, factor analysis, which is kind of like a principal component analysis, uh, where we see groups of species um, uh, showing up together uh, as a unit or loading on the factor one, and then different group of species uh, for a different factor. And the idea is that if we can um, plot the uh, density of canary rockfish versus another species, uh, and then uh, we, can, we might be able to predict the abundance of one relative to the abundance of another. Uh, notice that there are a couple sources of error. There's a source of error in estimating the um, uh, CPUE of uh, canaries and browns, and then there's another source of error associated with that regression. Um, but we're working on that right now. Uh, if we can do that, that'll be a great tool for understanding whether trends in these uncommon species. And this is what uh, th those two sources of error put together look like. An important part of our work is that we communicate this to the public and uh, we go out every year and have meetings and talk to people. So the uh, take home message is for the MPA monitoring, it's important to gauge the fishing community it's important to monitor these areas where you'll see the effects of the fishing. Um, there's high variability, and so we need to uh, consider the statistical power. Um, and w we have much more work to do to understand how you would tweak MPAs to make them better if you, if you can. So now the title of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, as I said at the beginning, you know, we had you know, two reasons for this work. One was the monitoring the MPAs. And the other was to see if we could come up with ways to use the MPAs for fisheries management and help in these data poor or data limited fishery uh, systems. So we have a, a, a grant from the Ocean Protection Council uh, to work on this and, whoops, um, We've got uh, some folks from DFG, NIMPS. Jason is a stock assessment scientist who is a Moss Landing grad. And uh, Kristen Honey from Stanford, Sarah Valencia from UC Santa Barbara, and John o. Wilson, who are modelers to help us on this. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, uh, about the work that Sarah and John o. are doing and show you, walk you through how we're doing this. So the first thing we do is we uh, simulate our data collection protocol in a hypothetical universe where we generate samples from inside and outside marine reserves and, and look at a size composition and catch per unit effort uh, so we can get an estimate of kind of differences in density and then uh, look at size structures of the stocks inside and outside. And then we're testing a number of different uh, data limited fishery models to see if those models can give us an understanding of what's going on in the near shore ocean. So we're comparing um, these data fishery models with basically what's going on right now is that uh, 
based upon the Marine Life Management Act and fishery management plans, the state has uh, limited the catch, use, used a, a catch, a quota, if you will, as a no more fish than 50% of the historical landings. And this is a system that was uh, developed in the, um, uh, or written up in the mid 90s uh, as a conservative measure to manage fisheries when you don't have very much information. It's called the Restrepo method uh, after one of the authors. And then we have a bunch of different um, new models based on density, on lengths, combination, and then on a time series. So I'm going to walk you through some of these things, and these are the uh, different ones that we're testing. But you can see these are all pretty new models, and so we're excited to be able to test them out and see if they work. So the density control rule, um, established by Beth Babcock and Alec McCall and Kerry McGilliard, basically says that we're going to see populations fluctuate with the environment. And um, when, when the populations outside the reserve in the reference sites deviate downward from the populations in the reference site, we're going to decrease the fishing effort. When the populations outside the reserve come close to the populations inside the reserve, we're going to increase fishing effort. And we're going to try to uh, make this difference about a 40% difference. So that's their model. The decision tree model uh, based, uh, is based upon, that uh, John o. Wilson developed, is based upon an unf the, the abundance of an unfished stock. You know, as a population gets older, you get fewer individuals. And with recognizing that um, you have a um, maximum number of eggs for the population produced here, and realizing that some of those really older fish are producing a lot of eggs per, per fish, and comparing that to a fish stock, which has a truncated um, fecundity and, and age structure and size structure. So his approach uses a, a decision tree. It looks at the uh, numbers of each size class coming out and adjusts uh, the fishing effort to try to maximize the numbers of fish in those larger size classes. A link-based reference point is similar to that, where um, the control rules, they're called, for managing the fishery, suggest that you want to have a, a combination of uh, fishes that, have, that span the entire uh, size structure of the population. There's a simple stock synthesis method that Jason Cope has developed, which basically uh, looks at fishery um, population dynamic information, such as the uh, mortality rate, the uh, growth rate, the birth rate, and models that to uh, try to show you what caused the population you have now, and then starts to tweak the control rules so that you can um, uh, make the population structure look how you would like it to. And, but that requires more time and more information. So we're taking those models and we're uh, using a variety of performance metrics to compare them. One is the biomass versus some sort of target biomass, such as no more than 40% of the unfished biomass. We're looking at the catches over time, the variability of the catches over time, and what's called the net present value. And that's the value to the fishery of all the fish you catch today and tomorrow and next year and on and on and on, all wrapped up into a ball and that's the value of the fishery. Recognizing that if you don't catch some today, you'll, you'll be catching them at a later time, but uh, we're comparing all that to today's dollars. So you can get an idea of whether it's better to um, push the catches out over time or catch more when they're younger, um, and that gives you an idea of the, the economic return. And the way we're doing that is we're using these management strategy evaluations, uh, which is a process of evaluating those results of a, a variety of different modeling. And basically, the management strategy evaluation starts out with a, an opera, operating model that we consider to be the truth, 
we take the dynamics of the fish stock and the fleet interactions, and then we have a data collection protocol, in this case our CCFRP data. We send it down into one of these six or seven different assessment models. We send that over based upon the, um, what the model says is the current population. We create regulations, send that back up into our uh, operating model, and see how that worked. And we know, for instance, if it, in, our, in our hypothetical world that the true fishing mortality is this, and we've estimated it to be this, and we, uh, which is, you know, there's a variance there. We see what, what that does over time. And uh, then we do this um, iteratively a thousand times uh, to see uh, what the likelihood is of having that stock crash over time or having it be stable over time. And we evaluate what happens over a 40 year time or 20 year time period to uh, see how close we are, are able to reach our objectives. So, um, kind of continuing how this works, we're going to, we were looking at starting with three model species uh, the blue rockfish, which has about a 30 year maximum age. It's relatively slow growing and relatively low productivity. Uh, the gopher rockfish is moderate um, productivity and lifespan. And the link cod is, um, I've got these two reversed, I think. That should be moderate productivity and this should be low productivity. And then the, a link cod's a fast growing, uh, higher product, productive species. So in our model, operating model, we have a hypothetical coastline we got different habitat patches, some good, some not so good. We got different densities of fishes, and we know the birth rates, the growth rates, uh, and movements, and fishing mortalities, and natural mortalities. We also have a, a hypothetical fleet that uh, fishes to optimize their catch, and then we uh, put in reserves. So we create patches with no fishing allowed, we sample inside and outside the reserves, and um, we look at the contrast between those areas. So that goes into our operating model, and out comes the results. So we start out with a hypothetical population, which is very similar to what we've seen on this coast, where uh, from the onset of fishing, which occurred, you know, massive fishing, which, fishing, which occurred in the mid-'70s, we see a decline uh, for 30 years in the population. And um, then uh, we start the MPAs, and of course, coincidentally, we've started the fishery management um, actions. And we see, we carry that out for the next 20 years to see how we're doing. And this model is the n status quo model, means you know, no, um, no management regulations other than the ones that are existing, no MPAs. Um, and we look at the spawning stock biomass over time relative to the target. This target is the 40% of the unfished biomass. And now re recognize this is after, let me back up quickly. This is this period here after the decline. So we're modeling uh, what's happened for the next uh, tw 20 or 30 years. So the Restrepo method, which is the um, maintaining catches at 50% of historical, brings the, the stock back up uh, to above that target level. Uh, the dynamic ratio method does as well. Uh, the uh, link bank spawning potential uh, ratio does. And the decision tree does, but more slowly. Um, and when you look at the catches over time, the, um, if we didn't have regulations, the catches would be higher. Um, our decision tree results in higher catches. The density ratio, uh, the catches drop for a while, and then the link the spawning potential ratio drop and then start coming back. And this is the 50%, um, the Restrepo method right here. Now, one of the, um, disadvantages of the current, uh, the Restrepo method, the current system, is that this, these catches are leveled off. And in periods of high population, you're under harvesting. 
And in periods of low population, you may be over-harvesting, but you don't know. You don't know the difference. Whereas with these other models, uh, you're presumably uh, fishing at a rate that's appropriate for the population. And then there are variances associated with all of this. But when you look at the, the cumulative net present value, or the, the dollar value over time, you see that there are some clear differences. Again, if you were just fishing, um, you'd be get, getting the most dollars, but then after a period of time, you wouldn't have any fish left. And, um, and, and uh, so on through the various models. So this, this work has just been started. Those graphs I showed you were done about three weeks ago. So um, I'm sure they're all wrong. <laughs> um, you know, um, the old saying that uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, so what we're, we're going to do next is to go back in and um, run these models over and over again, trying to see what they're sensitive to, whether they're sensitive to uh, influxes or recruitment events, or whether they're sensitive to uh, shifts in fishing effort, or sensitive to you know, large or small population changes and environmental events. And then we're going to compare them to see uh, how, they, um, how they work relative to our testing criteria, and um, hopefully uh, come up with a uh, suggestion, some suggestions to uh, the state about uh, ways that these models might be used, or these data limited fishery management methods might be used in the future. And uh, we've started those discussions with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Tom Barnes is on our, our group as well. So I um, want to end by saying uh, these are the motley crew that are responsible for all this. So if you just think it's garbage, talk to them. <laughs> if, if you like it, come to me. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, again, um, they're the ones that have done uh, the hard work on this. So happy to take any questions. Uh, qualified, yes. The um, state of Alaska does, has done, been doing that very thing for about 15, 16 years now, where they've used submersible and now they're starting to use ROV surveys to survey for yellow eye rockfish. And they have habitat areas that they've estimated and they have density estimates from yellow eye. And so they make that multiplication uh, to get a, a, a population size, and they manage based upon that. Kristen Hunter Thompson, a student of mine who graduated about two years ago, did a landscape scale ecology study using our submersible data and found that um, in some cases the, habit the densities on the edges of the habitat, habitat patch were different than the densities on the inside of the habitat patch and on the upwind side, up current side versus the down current side. So again, as long as you realize that those are poor estimates of the actual density, uh, then you could presumably uh, use those, that approach to model trends. I don't, I strongly believe you can't 
just multiply the, um, the rock area by densities from an ROV or from a sub and, and get an accurate estimate of the population. Because so many times uh, from the sub, we've seen I what appears to us to be identical habitat. One has no fish, one has lots of fish. And so habitat, the rock, is one component of the habitat and the currents are the other component. So as long as you're willing to accept that that's not a real population estimate, but um, are willing to take it as a, an index of relative abundance, then there's some possibility there. Yeah, um, I don't have a number for you. That's, that's next on our list to do um, in terms of turning to uh, those uh, catch recaptures. I don't think we've recaptured enough to get a robust estimate. Um, Mark Carr and I published a paper um, six or seven years ago uh, where we went in and caught fish in the kelp bed, tagged a couple thousand fish in a 500 meter by 500 meter area, and then scuba divers swam through and counted recaptures. And we got pretty good estimates from that. Um, but there was a lot of fish out there, uh, and just getting hook and line recaptures, we're, we don't, we're not, we're getting 2% recovery or something, and you know, you can, we'll see if we can make something out of it. For cow cod. For one year of fish, their comparison with the exception. So they and so, issue with well, yeah, but here's the good, here's the, they were um, half, they, their estimate can't be able to be half the population that the stock assessment showed. Who's right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why Mary's wanted to go back, and because that's an end of one. True, so is it really an accurate? Yeah. Assessment? So, I mean, that. I had a question for you, Rick. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I've used subs to do that, so I, I'm a proponent no, of that, but I just, yeah. you, we just need to be yeah. cognizant. Yeah, These are all I estimates. I agree with all the points that you made. That's yeah. Good What's the cost, then, of all those line surveys? Um, I get that question a lot. Um, um, I think over the six years, uh, we've got about $2 million invested. Um, that, no, no, um, that's, a, that's high. It's probably more like um, one and a half, 1.6. However, um, when you look at the value of the volunteers mm -hmm. and, and, and the value of the charter fishing boat, that adds another 30% uh, yeah. to the value. So um, what I always ask is, um, what's the value, uh, what's the cost to do things the way we're doing business now? Or what's the cost to get the same kinds of levels of stock assessment that NIMS is doing? I mean, what's NIMS's budget, you know, hundreds of million do of dollars for the West Coast per year? Um, so I, I think that costs need to be evaluated in terms of the amount of information versus what you're getting out of that information. And that's one thing we hope to do in here for instance, I don't know how much it costs you folks to gather um, estimates of lengths of fishes on the docks each year. For yeah. Surf, yeah. yeah. For well, for recreational, and then you're, and you're a biologist. Yeah. You know, I, I just don't know what that is. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm real curious, and that one yeah. that's one thing we promised to do on this grant because. It's it'd be it's interesting to see. All well, it I certainly is when you look at the different methods and try to right. include that in there because that's the really where it pays off. Right. Rick, I like seeing the some of the early results from the, the modeling work. And there seem to be some really clear trade offs between 
with rate of recovery versus catch. So how do you decide, you know, going forward? Which you know, which of these models is, is best to kind of capture the experience or the trade off that you're to deal with? I think you should ask those folks. Right. <laughs> because <laughs> I I won't have to make that decision. Uh, no, but actually <laughs> that's a really good point yeah. because at least in the federal arena, that's one of the things the council well, wrestles with is rebuild as quickly as possible right. given you know, whatever trade so the, the different models are clear, different trade-offs. Some are, are uh, oriented towards uh, catch over time. Some are oriented towards uh, more conservative um, rebuilding or a faster rebuilding and less catch. So those are trade-offs that will be political decisions. Um, but we're not trying to recommend that type of thing. We're trying to uh, show here are some tools that might, be, might or might not be useful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I actually realized I probably should know this, but I don't. And that is, um, in the density ratio method, does the size, you didn't mention the assumptions about the size of the NGAs or the size of oh, the, the si population that you're protecting in using that I, method? I think the only assumption is that um, you don't have a um, considerable amount of spillover to uh, so that you can say that there is a distinct difference between the reference site and the MPA. Yeah. Can I ask a question about on the genetic movements of some species? Um, I, I firmly believe that species such as Delta Lactis canary and Norman Bacilli. Yet in your um, summary, which the brochure that came out to program last week, you had the name clusters as one of those, and you would combine data. Um, I'd like to go look at that. We basically provided information and it was gathered together and, and graphed. We have some questions about that, but in the sub, Paul, we only see lunkers. You know, we see 70, 80 centimeter long vermilions, which we don't see in our CCFRP data. You know, we'll see 50 or 60. So I, I would think that overall you would see the, either an ontogenetic movement or those fish out in deeper water are just o much, much older and have grown for a length of time. But I, I, then again, I don't know where the small ver vermilions live. I I don't know where they are. I mean, that's what I'm hoping some student will figure out someday uh, because I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if nobody else has questions, um, then I should let him go and then we'll talk afterwards. <laughs>